This machine right here is basically magic. Let me show you. First, I turn on two special pumps that remove basically all of the gas in this bell jar, so the environment inside is basically like being in space. Next, I flow a tiny bit of an inert gas called argon into the chamber. And finally, I arm the system and send high voltage electricity through this odd looking cylindrical part. It stutters at first, but then a stable glowing beam of plasma forms. This plasma is hundreds of degrees, and weirder still, it's actually partially made of metal. And better yet, if we put something in that metallic beam, that object gets coated in that metal. The best part is that changing which metal becomes plasma is very easy. It uses these replaceable disks, and depending on which one I choose, it's possible to coat objects in all sorts of different materials. For example, here's a little 3D printed object. In this case, it's a Notre Dame Cathedral that we printed on a resin printer. If I stick it into the machine and put a disk of silver in here, I can very easily coat the plastic in silver metal. And this would work with basically any metal and any object. Here's a hornet that we also coated in silver, or here are some flowers we coated in pure gold. You certainly can't do that with electroplating. This machine is called a magnetron, and in my opinion, it's one of the things that's as close to magic as we've ever made as a species. And it's at the heart of so many industrial processes that the world would look very different without this type of machine. On top of that, this was the most complicated machine that I've ever made, and it took two people working basically full time more than two months to build it. While this is no Marble Machine X, it still had dozens of parts that needed to be machined to tight tolerances, so that everything would seal and function. It was a massive, massive challenge, but so much fun. This is actually the second video I've made about this system. In the last one, we took a deep dive into how this thing actually worked. We went section by section to explore how the different subsystems operate independently, and how they work together to make a complete functioning machine. We also took it for a test drive and coded a bunch of different things. One of my favorites were these playing cards that we made using cut vinyl to form a mask and a layer of pure gold. When you pull the vinyl off, any of the uncovered areas will remain coated in gold. The details come out so crisp and the final card looked awesome. The other one I really loved was this crow skull because the coating process really looked like we were attempting some sort of dark ritual. And the result looked surreal. It's hard to convey how much better this looks than something done with paint. Every surface detail is exactly the same, but looks as though it's simply been transmuted to a different element. It's bizarre, but I love it. In today's video, we're going to talk about how we actually built it since we mostly just focused on function last time. I have a huge amount of footage of the machining of most of this machine, though I did have a camera suddenly die at one point, so a little bit of that footage was lost to the void. This video will hopefully serve as a guide for those who want to build one of these themselves, or just want to learn about how all the pieces fit together and why we made the design choices that we did. At the end of the video, I'll show some of the experiments I'm currently doing in preparation for the final installment of this series, where we get into the much stranger functions of this amazing machine. As promised in the last video, I've put a link to a GitHub repo below with all the step files of every part of the machine. So that way, if you want to try and build one of these yourself, you've got some resources to start with and build on. But without further ado, let's jump right in. First off, where did we get our materials? Since this was the first major project we ever did in the new lab, we started off buying a lot of the stuff from a site called McMaster Car. That site is amazing, because they basically carry any engineering material you can think of, and frankly, plenty you didn't even know existed. For those mechanically inclined, it's kind of like being a kid in a candy store, but their prices can be a little bit high for some things, so we probably overpaid for a lot of the metal stock, but we were in a bit of a rush at the time. Later on in the project when we realized we still actually needed more materials, we found a local metal supplier instead that was much cheaper. So my advice is that McMaster is great for fittings and weird items, but for things like metal stock, try and find a local place. Now, the big question, how do we turn this amazing pile of materials into the machine you just saw? In the last video, we started by talking about the vacuum system, but this time I want to start even simpler. When we were first designing this machine, we had a few requirements that it needed to fulfill. One of which was that it had to be mobile, so we could put it away and it won't permanently eat up our limited floor space. So we designed and built a cart to house everything out of extruded aluminum. I absolutely love this stuff because it's really basically like adult Lego. We cut all the pieces to size using a chop saw and then had the fun task of deburring all of the pieces so that they could be threaded to accept a quarter 20 bolt. I don't know why, but this kind of felt reminiscent of peeling potatoes in preparation for a big dinner. Now, if you ever want to get really good at threading aluminum, build something out of this stuff. It took a solid few hours to thread all of these pieces, which means we went through a lot of cutting fluid. 
Whenever we're cutting or tapping something, we use this stuff called tap magic, which comes in two flavors. And I say flavors because one of them smells strongly of cinnamon, and one smells like Chinese stir-fry. I don't know why the designers of this stuff went with that, but it's definitely nicer than some of the sulfur smells of some of the other cutting fluids. It works like a charm, but that smell does get very overpowering, and we'd go home stinking of cinnamon after a day of machining. One of the reasons I say this stuff is like adult Lego is because there are hundreds of different adapters, corners, plates, connectors, and more to build it into any shape you want, and it's super easy to machine. So for example, when we wanted to mount some wheels to it, it was a very quick mill job to cut some holes and channels to fit the nuts, bolts, and wheels. The top of the cart was made of a material called Gerolite. This is a fiberglass epoxy laminate that is extremely insulating, but also very, very strong. This way, the main parts of the machine can rest sort of suspended on the Gerolite and not make any electrical contact with the aluminum frame. This way, if some of the very high voltage was connected to something incorrect by accident, it wouldn't electrify the frame and be a massive safety hazard. For the base of the cart, we just went with some plywood, but could have used more Gerolite if we wanted. Because Gerolite is literally made of glass fiber, cutting it can be a little bit tricky, though. It's a really tough material, so you just kind of have to go slow and take your time. Mounted to the top of the Gerolite is the base plate of the vacuum system. As we discussed last time, our design was based on Ben's from Applied Science, so we followed his lead and made the base plate out of a 12x12, 12 12, 1 inch thick aluminum slab. This gave us plenty of room to make any of the holes, threaded or otherwise, that we'd need to mount all the different pieces. For example, to mount the diffusion pump, we needed four threaded blind holes for some half inch threaded rod. With one inch of material to work with, that's plenty to thread the rod in without punching through to the other side. Though we did need to pick up a special bottoming tap for that job. Just like last time, I've left some links to Ben's video below so you can see his version of this machine. Also, just so you're ready for it, I'll be giving measurements in a mix of metric and imperial. Welcome to the world of living with freedom land on our southern border. All of our construction materials always come in some mix of the two, and so we just have to learn to work with both. Our lathe and mill, for example, are both imperial, so constantly converting back and forth would have been a nightmare, so we just used what's convenient at the time. Since the whole system needs to be under a fairly deep vacuum, anytime we punch a hole through the base plate, we do need a game plan for how we're going to seal it so that it doesn't leak. This was mostly accomplished by making sure that everything had a matching gasket that could be cinched down to make a good seal. Though sometimes we use this special epoxy called Hysol 1C. This stuff is rated for vacuum work, and for anything you know doesn't need to basically ever come off, it's a great choice. This actually brings up a really important point, and that's what materials can be used in a vacuum chamber. We had to choose the materials we made everything out of really carefully, because most things undergo what's called outgassing at these pressures. Basically, anything you expose to vacuum either needs to be made out of metal, vitin rubber, glass, or Teflon. Things like vinyl outgas a huge amount and will actually prevent the system from pressurizing properly sheerly because of the amount of gas they exude. So we used the bare minimum of it we could. The reason we chose these specific materials is quite simple. Vitin is the best for reusable gaskets as silicone is actually a bit leaky and will outgas more. If you must use a plastic, Teflon is about as good as it gets, so it's a good choice for any tubing or if you need something non-conductive that's easy to machine. And for metal, most will do, and we used a mix of aluminum, stainless steel, and oxygen-free copper. Aluminum is the easiest to machine, and fairly cheap, so most things are made out of that. Copper was used in the core of the sputter head because it needs to conduct a huge amount of heat away, but copper is very difficult to machine and quite expensive, so its use was purposely limited. And steel was used in places that would get hot and can't be easily cooled. One metal we did try to avoid, though, was using brass. Under high vacuum, and especially when it's heated in a vacuum, the zinc that is alloyed with copper to form the brass will literally evaporate out of the metal and contaminate everything. So even though it would have made machining easier, it had to be avoided. For the gaskets, we bought a big sheet of vitin and then cut them out with our new laser cutter. You need to wipe them down really well after the cut with some acetone to remove all the soot, but this gives crisp gaskets that fit perfectly every time, which is absolutely awesome. I remember the first time I built a machine like this, I tried cutting the gaskets out by hand, and the results were, let's say, less than ideal. Other than the gaskets, almost everything else was made either on the lathe, mill, or some combination of the two. I've wanted a proper lathe and mill for years, so getting to use these has been an absolute dream. One thing I should mention quickly is my partner in crime for this project, and that's my friend and crew member, Frank. He's a super talented mechanical engineer and did all of the CAD work for basically every piece of the machine. 
We split the work so that he'd do all the mill work and I'd do all the lathe work and we'd just pass the parts back and forth as needed. It was great having the engineer next to me so that inevitably when I'd make a mistake and overcut something, we could quickly hash out the tolerances and whether or not I'd need to start the part again. And remember kids, always ruin the first part. Otherwise, can it really be called machining? Though, to be honest, that was thankfully pretty rare, and the tolerances on most parts are pretty forgiving. The only one I really had to scrap was my first attempt at machining oxygen-free copper, but we'll get back to that in a bit. Since there are a couple dozen parts on the machine, rather than showing every single one being made, I wanted to highlight some of the more interesting ones and how the complex assemblies fit together. A lot of the most complex work centered around four assemblies. The sputter head, the diffusion pump baffle, the high current feed through, and the rotary couplings. Let's start with the baffle. The vacuum pumping system is broken into two main pieces. The first is a mechanical pump, and the second is this weird looking thing called a diffusion pump. The diffusion pump takes an already moderate vacuum pressure and drops it far lower. It works by boiling oil creatively, but one of the side effects of that is that sometimes oil will fly too high up in the column and end up in the main vacuum chamber, which would be very, very bad. This water-cooled baffle is there to prevent that. If we look at a cross-section of the baffle, you can see that there are two slots on the top and one on the bottom, and no straight paths through it. In a vacuum system, particles of gas, or in this case oil vapor, basically fly in straight lines, so for oil vapor to get through here, it has to bounce off at least one of the walls of the baffle. But since it's water-cooled with very cold water, this causes it to quickly condense and drip back into the pump instead of bouncing into the chamber. Making it was pretty straightforward and was all just basic millwork. This was made of a 6x6 and 1 and 3 quarter inch thick aluminum slab. Because of how thick this was, we couldn't just mill the slots out fully because our T-slot cutter wouldn't reach to the depth that we needed. So we had to do it in a few steps. First, milling the majority of the slots, then chamfering the upper edges so the cutter could fit just a little bit deeper, and then finally using the T-slot cutter to finish it off. The other features though are nice and simple. The first are two through holes that run the length of the block. These are the water cooling channels, and with some quarter inch NPT barbs on each end of the channel, they can be connected to the main water cooling system with some silicon tubing. That system, by the way, is just a pump, Peltier cooler, and reservoir tank. There's one other hole that intersects with one of the vacuum slots, and this is where we attached a Teflon line for the vacuum gauge and a venting valve to release the pressure in the system. To finish this off, we first took a facing cut on both sides to get a nice flat surface. Then we cut off the unnecessary corners of the block and it was on to polishing. Since this has to seal with the diffusion pump and the base plate, both surfaces need to be polished very well so that there would be a nice, smooth surface for the gasket to seal to. I did this with an orbital sander and took an hour or two to slowly work my way up from 120 grit to 3000 grit. Now with the appropriate gaskets and a good dose of Dow Corning vacuum grease, this sealed up nicely to the base plate and diffusion pump. Just quickly, the base plate was made in basically the same way, where each hole had to be carefully marked out, then drilled. And some needed to be tapped, like we discussed before. All pretty standard stuff, save for the main hole for the diffusion pump, which we cut using a hole saw since it was oversized. After everything was cut, just like the baffle, it had to be thoroughly polished so that everything will seal to it. Okay, let's move on to the really complex stuff, specifically the magnetron sputtering head. This assembly has the most pieces by far of anything in the system, and it alone took more than a week of machining. Something that makes this assembly super weird is that the outer shell has to be grounded while the core has to be floating at usually 600 to 800 volts DC. And the whole thing is going to fill up with plasma. So making it solid, while also being able to quickly sub out the targets on the top, and have no arcs or stray electrons flying everywhere while only making plasma where you want it, was a bit of a challenge. Here's a cross-section and exploded view of the whole assembly. Inside the core is a set of ring magnets sitting on top of a turned steel pole piece. This is here to collect all of the plasma that forms between the core and the ground shield into a hot, tight donut of plasma. This is what forms that beam you saw earlier. It needs to be kept cold or the magnets will be ruined, and also the metal could melt, which would be very, very bad. So most of the complexity of the core actually comes from the need to water cool it. The two barbs are what allow us to connect the water cooling lines to the core. O-rings and O-ring grooves are here to contain the water where we want it and not leak into the vacuum chamber. It's not shown in the diagram, but there's also an O-ring that sits between the lower copper piece and the magnet. This pushes the magnet into contact with the copper so it gets cooled and prevents it from getting wet, which would rust the steel pole piece. To prevent air getting trapped in the pocket formed by this, a hole was drilled up through the lower copper piece so that the gas can be removed and we even carved a ring-shaped channel into the pole piece so that the hole would line up regardless of how the magnet was inserted. 
The hardest part of making this was that we had to use oxygen-free copper. But oxygen-free copper, to be blunt, is a bastard. It's like trying to carve chewing gum that hardens as soon as you touch it. So as you're turning the parts, a thin shell of extremely hard metal forms where you just cut. But when you try and push through that layer, suddenly it'll give way and you're back into the gummy soft layer below which grabs onto the tool and will either just break it or yeet the copper. We broke a huge amount of carbide, but most of that pile of dead cutters came just from machining these two pieces. It also makes getting a nice surface finish really tricky. And while I'm sure there are machinists in the comments who are just going to be like, well, you just need to do X, Y, and Z and it works so easily, neither of us are professional machinists and this was our first experience with this metal. And that experience mostly consisted of a whole lot of swearing. The rest of the pieces of the sputter head were much more forgiving. These consist of a collection of Teflon spacers and grommets, a two-part aluminum base that threads into the base plate, and a stainless steel ground shield that covers the core. The grommets allow us to use normal steel bolts to hold everything together without actually making electrical contact between the core and the rest of the assembly. For example, four pairs of grommets and spacers were used to hold the core to the cup-shaped aluminum base, and grommets were again used for these four bolts that hold a retainer ring onto the top of the core. This is what lets us sub out the metal we're using quickly, since we just need to loosen three of the bolts and remove one of them to slide in a new disc. The ground shield is there so that the only thing that gets sprayed out the top is the metal we're interested in, and everything else is blocked. It also helps contain the plasma a little bit. It was made out of a stainless steel tube and a second stainless steel faceplate which we had to weld together. The last detail is how we get power to the core, and that's this pin at the bottom. It runs through the bottom of the sputter head and is held in place by a Teflon piece. Originally, the rod was supposed to make contact with a spark plug that was threaded into the bottom of the base plate of the vacuum chamber, but that had to be replaced with a DIY solution when I realized that most spark plugs have a built-in resistor that completely ruins the function of the sputter head. My DIY solution was just a bit of Delrin that I quickly turned and threaded, and then epoxied another piece of steel rod into its center. But that's basically it for the sputter head. It's a lot of pieces, as you can see, and it definitely took some futzing with it to get everything to fit nicely. But it came out amazing, and is probably the most arc reactor looking thing I've ever made. And for those who want to get more into the physics of how it works, I've put links to the first video below. Now, I want to move on to something I didn't talk about at all in the last video, and that's the motion controls. When we designed this, I knew I wanted to be able to move at least two things in the chamber at any time. The first is a shutter that lets you sputter any oxides and any other junk away when you start the run, so that the thing you're coating is only ever exposed to nice, clean metal. And then the other is, of course, the ability to move the object that's being coated so that way we can get nice, even coatings. Ben was able to CNC mill his version of this directly into his base plate, but we lack a CNC mill, so went with a design that allowed us to turn most of the stuff on a lathe. Here's a cross-section of the assembly. A steel rod runs up through the center, but the trick is, how do we make this seal well and still be able to move? We managed that by cutting out tiny gaskets that had to stretch onto the rod so that it fits tightly, and also fit very tightly into a recess that we cut for it. With a good glob of vacuum grease, this seals very well. To hold the gasket into its hole, and to prevent the rod from wiggling around, I made aluminum bushings that fit on top and into a larger recess above the gasket. Finally, to hold all those pieces down, we use these clamp-on collars. The whole assembly has a big flat on one end, and is threaded on the other end to accept these massive nuts, which is a hard thing to say with a straight face. The unthreaded end has a matching gasket, so with the nut on the other side of the base plate, the whole thing can be tightened down to seal. At the bottom of the rod, I made these little gearboxes that let me translate the motion 90 degrees. I just 3D printed some gears and laser cut some wood for the gearboxes, and used more clamp-on collars and a little bit of strategic drops of superglue to hold everything together. This way, I can run a second rod to the control panel area and be able to move things around in the chamber easily without either having to stand up, or worse, shove my hand through a tangle of high voltage wires to get at the rods. The last piece I want to highlight is the high current feed-through. We've mostly been talking about the magnetron because it's frankly the flashier part of this machine, but there's actually a whole second function that I haven't mentioned at all yet. There are two other electrodes in the vacuum chamber specially made to have these molybdenum boats suspended between them. A very high current can then be passed through the boat, which makes it glow white hot, so that anything you put in the little dimple of the boat will evaporate and coat things. The question though is how do you pass high current through the base plate? We managed this with a copper piece that was threaded at one end to accept a custom aluminum nut, and a Teflon sleeve and washer which fit around everything, and of course some gaskets so it all sealed. Speaking of which, let's talk about the power system really quickly. 
Both the high voltage and high current needed for the two different systems were supplied by microwave oven transformers. One was unmodified, but the other one had the secondary replaced, so that instead of stepping up 120 volts to 2000 volts, it could drop it down to about 1 volt by massively increasing the current. One trick is that high current wires like this come in two styles. A few very thick strands of wire bundled together, which makes for very stiff cables, or many very thin wires bundled together, which leaves them very bendy. You need the second kind to rewind a transformer, as I found out the hard way. The best source for these bendy high current cables are actually jumper cables. With jumper cable wire, it was so much easier to make the two turns of wire needed for this to work. But that's most of the systems I want to cover. There is one detail left though, and that's a few notes about the control panel and what's mounted to it. Specifically, these gas flow controllers. First off, these things are not accurate, which is a shame because they cost $200 a piece. Sometimes they read no gas flow, but the vacuum gauge clearly shows lots of gas flowing into the chamber. The other issue with them is for them to be used in vacuum system, it's best to take the whole central cartridge out and flip it upside down so that the valve is on the vacuum side. That's why it looks like these are upside down, but the manufacturer does not make this easy. We actually had to machine a custom tool that was sort of like a hollowed out flathead screwdriver, just to loosen the nuts that hold this thing together. None of our collection of weirdly shaped pliers would do the job, but our custom made tool worked perfectly. Other than that, I'll quickly mention that the control panel itself was simply made out of laser cut plywood that was painted black. But that's it for the build. If there's interest, I have almost 90 hours of machining all of these different parts, so if you'd like to see an engineering cut of just that footage, let me know in the comments. Now, before I show you some of the experiments that I'm working on for the final part of this series, we need to take a quick moment to thank the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. I am by no means a conventional learner, as should be pretty obvious by this video. I've never been one for tests and memorizing, and I'm much more interested in learning how you figure out the answers to questions, rather than just straight up memorizing the answers to them. All the super hard science problems we explored in this video are all solved by just breaking them down into bite-sized pieces and tackling those pieces one at a time. And Brilliant is a great way to learn to do just that. Brilliant is an amazing online learning platform that lets you learn at your own pace, and lets you work through a huge variety of different subjects. I really love their scientific thinking course especially. Right from the beginning, they start with the notion that science is just a puzzle, and I love that mentality. If you'd like to try Brilliant for free, then click the link in the description below, or go to brilliant.org slash the Thought Emporium to get started. And the first 200 people will get 20% off your first year of learning. Okay, let's wrap this up and look at some pretty sputtering footage. First up was an attempt to thermally evaporate some glow powder. I really want to be able to make thin glowing films, because frankly I think it's going to look awesome, but our attempts at this failed pretty hard. When we tried to do it thermally, we managed to basically burn the oxygen out of the material and were left with a thin silvery layer that might actually be a strontium aluminum alloy, which was pretty weird. We also tried laying the powder on the magnetron head, but that failed spectacularly. But the one I think you'll be the most excited about is this experiment. This time, we've got a little bit of propane mixed into the argon, and we've put a piece of graphite foil on the sputter head. In this shot, in theory, we're actually growing a material called diamond-like carbon. There's something about these diamond-like carbon layers that just give the absolute best colors. The ground shield looked amazing afterwards, and sputtering it onto aluminum gave this awesome rainbow. But when we let it just grow on glass, it forms a brown and then black layer. I'm having these samples tested to see, well, how diamondy they are, but I'll save the results of that for the next video. That's where I'll leave it for this video, though. As usual, I need to thank my amazing patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi who make these videos possible. Your support goes a long way to help me tackle these crazy builds. This was easily the most expensive project I've ever done on this channel, and it was only possible because of all of you, so thank you so much. Your support is greatly appreciated. But that's it for now, though. As always, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, and ring that bell to see when I post new videos. And be sure to check out my other social media pages to see these projects long before they end up in videos. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.